What is the first word that comes to your mind when I say the word calculus? Probably fear, trepidation, thoughts of great difficulty. Well, I was a freshman when I first encountered a calculus. Now, if you know anything about calculus, you've run across the name of Gottfried Leibniz. And uh, along with Isaac Newton, he is credited with uh, developing this wonderful system of mathematics. But in addition to being an incredible mathematician, Leibniz was also a formally trained philosopher. <coughs> and perhaps the most thought-provoking question that he ever posed was this one. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Have you ever wondered about that? Chances are you have. I know as a little kid, I often wondered, what would it be like if there was nothing out there? No sun, no moon, no stars, no majestic mountains, no rolling, foaming seas, no blue sky, no creatures large or small, no people, no you, nothing. Close your eyes for a moment. Just try to think of nothing. The father of modern science, Aristotle, was once asked if he could describe what nothing was. And he replied, nothing is what rocks dream about. <laughs> uh, that's, I can't think of a better definition than that, can you? Nothing is what rocks dream about. Now, although there are a number of world religions that insist that everything around us is an illusion from experience, from our experience, it is really quite obvious that what is around us is very real. But if someone were to ask you, what reasons would you give for why the world and life exists? Jews and Christians, they attribute the first book of the Bible, Genesis, as well as the next four books of Scripture, to Moses' authorship and compilation. And these five books make up what is called the Pentateuch, five volumes, like the Pentagon. There are five books in that source. It's some of the oldest material that you'll find in the Holy Scriptures. The first chapter of Genesis takes us back to the very beginning of the universe, yet unlike a, a dry textbook, it reveals the Creator's handiwork in a very highly stylized poetry and narration. It's important for us to remember, because I think this has been abused in the past, that it's important that we understand that the Bible as a whole, and the book of Genesis, specifically the first two or three chapters of Genesis, is not a scientific textbook. It never was meant to be a scientific textbook, although it may contain some limited scientific truth. You see, Genesis was written to an entirely different audience, an audience that lived before the age of scientific inquiry. They do not, they did not possess our framework of understanding. For instance, all the ancients, they believed that you thought with your intestines. That's why we still talk today about having a gut feeling about something or a gut feeling about someone. Now, the ancients, they knew that the world was round, but they thought it was a flat disk, not a sphere. They thought that beyond the sky, there was a solid barrier and that the stars and planets were not astronomical bodies, but gods and goddesses, and demigods to be worshipped. Today's average first grade child knows more scientific truth than these folks ever, do, ever did. Today, many people still ask the question, why? But scientists, science, 
primarily asks the question, how? How? How does the universe work? How does the human body work? How are various weather patterns produced? How does geology work? It all ties into that cause and effect relationship that we talked about last week. Now, back during the early Bronze Age, we're talking around 2000 BC, people were simply not interested in the how questions. They just took it for granted that these things existed, but they were very interested in knowing the why question. They weren't interested in knowing the how, they were very interested in knowing the why. And intricately intertwined with the question of why is who? Who? Genesis 1 answers this fundamental question. Look what Moses put down. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters that separate the waters. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so, and God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place. And the dry, dry ground appeared and it was so. And God called the dry ground land. And the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land to bear fruit with seed in it according to its various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning a third day. And God said, let there be light in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser night to govern the night. And he also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing with which the water teems, and that moves about it, about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the water of the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that moved along the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. Real quick before we move on, notice that it doesn't say how. None of that says how God did it. None of it explains the mechanics of it all. It just says that God did it. And, and we shouldn't assume that just because it says it's a day, that it's a 24-hour day that we experience. I happen to believe that it probably took epochs of time to create. But it's compacted. It's poetic to convey a basic truth that God is the one who created it. Now, it's really striking as you read this passage 
to look at the very stark contrast between the phrases formless and empty or void with the opposite of heaven and earth in verse 1. The earth is this dark, undifferentiated blob that is completely inhospitable to life, particularly human life. Many of the ancient accounts of creation talk about this, including the Babylonians and the Egyptians and the Akkadians. They talked about it in terms of turbulent, chaotic, churning waters. The waters were ruled by monsters, and their creation stories recount about how their primary god or goddess defeated the sea monsters and brought order out of disorder and chaos. In the Babylonian myth, Tiamat is this huge bloated um, dragon and that personifies the salt water of the ocean, the water of chaos. And she is the primordial mother of everything that exists, including the gods and goddesses themselves. Her consort is a creature named Apsu, who is the personification of the freshwater abyss that lies beneath the earth. And from their union, salt water and fresh water, the first pair of gods were born. They were Lakmu and Lakamu, parents of Ansar and Kishar, grandparents of Anu and Ea. And in the, uh, in the Babylonian creation epic called the Enuma Elish, which was written over 4,000 years ago, their descendants started to get irritated and annoyed with Tiamat, uh, or it, the descendants started to um, annoy Tiamat and Apsu, and they decided, well, we're going to wipe them out. We're going to kill our offspring. Ea, one of the grandchildren, discovered their plans, and he managed to kill Apsu while he was asleep. Tiamat then flies into this giant rage, and when she learns about his death, she wants to avenge that death. And she created an army of monstrous creatures, which was led by her new consort, Kinju, who was also her son. Eventually, Tiamat was defeated by the young god Mardu, who was born in the deep freshwater seas underneath the earth. Mardu then cleaved Tiamat's body in half, and from her upper half, he created the sky, and from the lower half, he made the earth, and from her water came forth the clouds, and her tears formed the Tigris and Euphrates River. Kinju also perished, and from his blood, Marduk made the first human beings. Contrast this story, this account, with man's creation in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. This is what Moses writes. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit and seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath in it, I give you every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw that all that he made was good, very good. The Babylonian creation story would have been very familiar to the Hebrews 
as it was for many of the people throughout the Mediterranean and Mesopotamian region. Now, if you were the one true God, wouldn't you have wanted to set the record straight? Wouldn't you be concerned enough to want to explain to your children their true origin? Well, the answer is sure you would. You don't want them to be ignorant. You don't want them to be misled. Such a mistaken understanding would lead to incredible harm. First, it would taint people's understanding and relationship with the world around them so that they would actually worship the world and the things of the created order. It would foul people's understanding of who they were and impact their relationship with other people. You know, there's some world religions where they worship other people. In the Hindu religion, for instance, when they greet one another, they bow. That's not just a kind bow. It's actually a genuine genuflection. They're worshiping the God within the other person. That's their understanding. Ultimately, it would corrupt in an accurate understanding of God, who He was, and it would impair and destroy, ultimately, their relationship with Him. You would not want that if you were the one true God. In contrast to both this mythological picture of God and the emptiness that we read of in that first verse of Genesis, we see the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, hovering over the waters, the waters that He created, the waters that He was in total control of, in his book, I Believe the Holy Spirit, Oxford scholar Michael Green writes this, The word used for the Spirit of God, both in Hebrew and Greek, is highly significant. Ruach in Hebrew and Pneuma in Greek have three main meanings of wind, breath, and spirit. Wind, breath, spirit. The Spirit of God is His life giving breath without which human beings remain lifeless. Physically lifeless. Spiritually lifeless. I once heard a believing biology professor talk about this, and he held this dead branch of a tree in his hand. And he said, you know what, we can put this on the ground and we can bombard it with as much energy of any kind that we want, of every kind that we want, and that will never come to life. Its matter is really pretty highly organized, but it's dead. Its DNA is all there. If you scrape some of it up and, and put the proper chemicals in, you could find out what its DNA was. It's all there. But even with that framework, all the energy in the world focused upon that dead stick will not turn it green and cause it to bud and flower. Now, consider a, a morass of matter with any, without any kind of organization. It's just all in a giant soup. You could throw as much energy at that soup that you want, but it will never organize into the simplest of cells, not even the simplest of amino acids that make up cells. But this is what is taught today in our colleges and in our high schools. We continually are bombarded with this by PBS and the Learning Channel and National Geographic. This is the formula that they throw out there for our consumption. Raw, inorganic matter, plus time, plus blind chance, equals life. Raw, inorganic matter, plus time, plus blind chance, equals life. That's their formula. God is no longer necessary, then, to explain, explain why there is something rather than nothing. And it actually takes a tremendous amount of faith to believe that formula.
to believe that answer, that answer to a why question. It's a modern myth. It is a contemporary fairy tale in many respects no different from the ancient mythology of Tiamat and Marduk. It persists today in the face of powerful evidence to the contrary, evidence that many are unwilling to come to grips with because for them the alternative to a godless universe is completely unacceptable. They don't want there to be a god. Did you know that scientists once believed that whatever the initial conditions of the universe, eventually intelligent life might evolve. But we know that our existence actually is balanced on a knife's edge. Our existence is balanced on a knife's edge. It seems vastly more probable that a life prohibiting universe rather than a life permitting universe like ours would exist. It seems highly more likely that there should be nothing rather than something. The existence of intelligent light depends upon a conspiracy of initial, initial conditions that must be precisely fine-tuned to agree, a degree that is literally incomprehensible and incalculable. For example, Stephen Hawking has estimated that if the rate of the universe's expansion just one second after the Big Bang had been smaller than by, uh, by uh, one part in a hundred thousand million million, that is a very small number, the universe would have recollapsed into a giant fireball. It wouldn't have happened. There are around 50 such quantities or qualities and constraints present in the Big Bang like this one, which must be fine-tuned in such a way in the universe to permit life. And it is not just each quality or quantity that has to be exactly fine-tuned. Their ratios to one another have to be in precise uh, measurements as well. So improbability is added to improbability is added to improbability until our minds are reeling with an incomprehensible number. Excuse me, wouldn't you agree that the initial conditions for the beginning of the universe make sense of a creator God? Yes, it does. Picture this. Say you have a chimpanzee, and uh, you set that chimpanzee at a computer or a typewriter, and you have them just randomly punching out numbers and letters. Any intelligible sequence of letters hammered out is really probably equally improbable. But if we find a beautiful poem, a beautiful sonnet, a beautiful haiku that's been typed. And we know that uh, this is not the result of blind chance, since it conforms to the uh, independently given patterns of grammatical English sentences. In the same way, physics and biology tell us, independently of any knowledge of the early conditions of the universe, what the physical conditions required for life are. Do you understand that? When we discover how incredibly improbable such conditions are, it's a combination of a specified pattern plus improbability that serves to demonstrate the idea that everything that exists is the product of chance or accident. That's what's concluded. That's what I'm saying is, is what we ought to do. The uh, Scottish poet and artist William Blake understood that it wasn't by chance that everything came into existence. And as the Age of Enlightenment gave way to the scientific revolution at the end of the 19th century, and many of the intellectuals and artists at the time began to question God and began to abandon Him, He reminded the world of the importance 
of not just asking how questions, scientific questions, but more importantly, it's we have to answer the ask the who question. This is what he wrote. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. In the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy mortal symmetry? No, no one is an accident. None of this is an accident. You are not an accident. None of us are an accident. It makes no sense of the universe to believe that it just magically happened. Everything we observe points to, to the truth that we were expected and prepared for. You were expected, you were prepared for. As the line of the song that I sang earlier claims, before even time began, my life was in his hands. That is incredible to think about. Everything around us was lovingly and intentionally prepared for us. Why is there something rather than nothing? The only reasonable conclusion is God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we look at the world around us, we are simply amazed at its intricacy. We're filled with wonder as we look at the mountains and the sea and all the creatures and and, and Lord, as we look through our telescopes, we, we see space stretch out before us. And as we look through the microscope, we, we see such tiny creatures and then atoms and things smaller than atoms. And we look at all of that, God, and we are just astounded. God, we understand that this could not have happened by accident. And Lord, we don't understand how. Even the best of our scientists still do not understand how. But Lord, thank you that we do understand why. And more importantly, we thank you that we understand who. Lord, we're reminded what your servant Solomon said. The thing that really matters is to know you. Lord, help us to know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll join in our closing course, the trees of fear.